Jesus said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all here. Um, Pastor Linda is in Mexico City. I believe we've got some pictures. I got some pictures over on the internet or whatever you call that thing we look at. <laughs> Come at me. And uh, I think I've seen daughter there and they're doing whatever they're doing there. And so we wish her well and Godspeed and the, you know, the protection of the, the Spirit be upon her. Uh, my name is Lamont Wilsey. I haven't been here for about a year. It's good to see old friends and see some strangers. It's nice to be back. Because I'm getting to do what I really love doing, which is, it's, I, you know, I've, I've been ordained now 44 years or something like that, and now it's just, it's not even second nature, it's that I've stepped into my nature. So thank you for giving me this opportunity. However, we have a, shall I, shall I say, a challenging gospel for today. Uh, not only do we, uh, are we going to talk about Satan, which is something that most Episcopalians are a little uncomfortable with. A little uncomfortable. What is Satan? We, are, um, we have problems because we are heirs of an intellectual tradition in the Episcopal Church that is of the Enlightenment. And we don't believe in demons. We don't believe that sickness is punishment and all these things. That, that I think we pretty much agree. But so when you are confronted by the concept of Satan... What do you do? So it's a challenging gospel for today. And I want to unpack the gospel today um, by using the Herald, Magdoff newspaper, for last Thursday. This is Thursday's Herald. And there are three uh, major stories uh, in it, in, in the Herald on that day. The major uh, call out or headline was Shooting Survivors Issue Call for Action. Then there was a, an announcement of Billy uh, Graham's death at age 99. That's above the fold, a big deal. And then there is this little corner over here, which goes on a lot longer than the articles, an article about anchovies. <laughs> So, as I say, it's a challenging gospel using the newspaper because we Episcopalians were uncomfortable with Satan. Billy Graham raises all sorts of issues for those Episcopal priests who have to preach. And then the little anchovies, well, we'll talk about them toward the end. <laughs> Satan, what is Satan? Well, the word, the word means adversary or tempter, Satan, as it's pronounced, I believe. And it is a, um, as I say, it's an uncomfortable subject for me because I sort of don't believe in spirits like that. I, I'm, I'm behind God. I get the notion of God and the Trinity. But when you start talking about demons and, uh, and Satan and tempters, I have a real problem. But here's my question to begin to think about Satan. What is it that caused Nicholas Cruz to think shooting 17 people in a school was an appropriate way to spend the day? Was it a mistake? Was he sick? The problem that we have, that I have as a Christian, is trying to come to grips with that reality. How many times have you heard, well, mistakes were made? <laughs> Nicholas Cruz did not make a mistake. He wasn't making a mistake. A mistake is when you're doing your taxes and you had 393 and 427 against 622, or 623. That's a mistake. It isn't a mistake to do that. In the Garden of Eden, our parents were set in there and were given knowledge of the of good and evil. Knowledge of good and evil. What is that force, that spirit, that dynamic that helps us, causes us, tempts us to do the wrong thing even 
though we know they're wrong. Anybody ever done something you know was wrong? Raise your hand. Come on, we're in church. <laughs> You're going to be honest. Come on. You can't be honest here. My word, what are you going to do when you... Well, whatever. <laughs> so, coming to grips with why we do what we know to be wrong is a very big deal, and has always been a big deal. There is a uh, fellow named John Templeton. Uh, anybody running money here? Mutual fund guy? Anybody here? John Templeton invented the mutual fund in the 30s. He got started when they moved to Bermuda to avoid the taxes. And he started the Templeton Prize. And the Templeton Prize is a very big deal in religion. It is uh, an award given to the person every year who makes the greatest advance in religion, science, and society. It's a big deal. I mean, it's like enough that if you can come up with today any reason other than sin for why people do the wrong thing, well, donate it to the church when you get the Templeton Prize because it will endow the parish. There is no other explanation than the power of sin. And what gives sin that power? Why not call it Satan? Now, sins aren't just individual sins. They can be communal sins. I mean, most of us think of sins as, you know, basically liquor and adultery and sins of the flesh, so to speak. But there are communal sins. And let me give you an example of one called idolatry. Now again, from the Herald, here's the story, terrible pictures of, of teeners crying on the, uh, on the front page. And which I, you know, read my and you say, God, please have mercy on them. And then you turn to the back, literally a golden cat. There are 23 pictures of guns on the back of the barrel. And they have such ironic names as Varmint Terror, Oh, uh, Smith & Wesson Shield, a tactical, a tactical, you can make yourself a 12 inch tactical. So, you know, when you're defending your home, you can blow them away. And, and it's not that they're all legal. There's no stock up here that has a barrel length of less than 18 and a half inches. So it's legal. It's legal. You can go buy your shotguns to do it. And there's a special one for $99. That is idolatry. That is a sin. That is against the will of God. Guns. Imagine on the day after this problem, this is the act. Imagine. What is going on? What is going on is the tempter. What is going on is Satan is at work in our society. Now, what are we going to do about that? What are we going to do about this sin, Satan, this temptation that causes us to do the wrong thing even though we know it's right? What is the way out? Now we're going to talk about Billy Graham. Now we're going to talk about Billy Graham. Died on uh, Wednesday at age uh, 99. On, uh, in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, or he has a retreat up there in the hills there. And he was um, somebody, he is, was, he is somebody that I've grown really to admire, and I will admit, envy. He was born in Jim Crow, North Carolina, and when he was seven, he decided he wanted to be, he wanted to be a preacher. What he wanted to do, he, he felt this call of God as a, as a as a kid, and he wanted to preach, and so he went to uh, he grew up in the deep south, and he went to uh, a number of colleges and bounced around, and so he went to Wheaton College, which is the evangelical college in Illinois, and he graduated in 1942 with a degree in anthropology. Now, I find that interesting. I thought he was just a Bible-thumping, big-haired Southern cracker. But he isn't. He actually is a smart guy. And he studied anthropology. And what he studied in anthropology, if you do anthropology in, in cultural discipline, so you look at statues, and you look at religious artifacts, and you look at expressions of the human soul. And he began to realize the humanity that he wanted to preach to. He understood the, 
the anchovies, the fish that he was preaching to. And boy, did he preach. He preached. He would do crusades, as most of you probably know, and he did it for 40 years, and in his lifetime, according to the article, he preached in person to over 215 million people in 40 years. 215 million. Now, I'm going to say there are 100 here. That's a lot of Sundays for me if I'm going to catch up with Billy Graham. That's what I mean about a little bit of envy about Billy Graham. He also discovered, he was one of the first, really, to discover radio and TV, and using those media, it is reckoned by Nielsen that 2.2 billion people heard his message, the good news of Jesus Christ. Billy Graham brought evangelical American Christianity into as much respectability as it has. And in a way, I say I not only envied him, but as one pro to another, I had to give him the tip of the hat. He had everything. Good voice, great looks, moral rectitude. And what was his message? It was about Satan. It was about sin. His message was this. If you accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you could be reconciled to your God, your neighbor, and yourself. The, the tyranny of sin could be broken. You could send Satan away with a spanking of laughter. In short, through Christ, you could begin to become what your better angel is calling you to be. And Billy Graham had a pretty compelling message. Can I get an amen on that? <laughs> so I've talked about Satan as the adversary, the one that's difficult to believe in, but manifestly real. Manifestly real. We've talked about Billy Graham, the preacher. And so now let's talk about the third item on the front page. We've got the shooting people, victims. Uh, here's Billy's obit. And now, in the little corner, is about anchovies. Though just a little fish, the northern anchovy is a big deal for wildlife and tourism on the west coast. The little old anchovy, Camry Row anchovy, is a very important critter. Although small, it is at the bottom, well not quite the bottom, of a food chain that ends with us, <laughs> basically the apex predator of the world. But through it, it goes through, you know, rock cod, and it goes through porpoises, and it goes through whales, and then it comes to us. The little anchovy is on the front page of the Herald to remind us that's what we are. The Christian symbol for Christians is what? Not fish. We are a little fish, and yet we are at the bottom of a food chain that goes to heaven. The front page of the Herald gives us these three points for the sermon. Now the anchovies have been in danger, but we are learning how to bring them back. We did it with wild turkeys. In the early 70s, the American uh, turkey, wild turkey, was almost extinct. Uh, the mountain lion, almost extinct. Now it's back to the point where you better count your cats and poodles <laughs> in the morning. They are thriving. The point is this, everybody. We know what to do. We know what to do. And if we don't know what to do, we can learn what to do. And that's the challenge for us today. We have to learn what to do about ridiculous mass shootings. One every other day since the 1st of January of this year in this country. One every other day. We have to know what to do about this force that leads us astray to terrible deeds. So what to do? Let's get not just anthropological, but get ecclesiologically squared away. We need to 
bring back the purpose of our faith, which is to make us humble, not proud. By giving ourselves, our souls, and our bodies to a nobler and more righteous cause than sin and despair, sin and despair, despair is a sin, we are brought to Christ. I close with this. In a few minutes, we're going to have an Episcopal altar call. Now, dial down, I know. <laughs> Satan, Jimmy Graham, now altar call. Okay. It's going to be done, as we say in the Episcopal Church, decently and in order. And what's going to happen is that after I consecrate the bread and the wine, I'm going to go down and we're going to sing the great Billy Graham altar call hymn. It's 693 in your hymnal, just as I am without a little plea. And I'm going to ask everybody who comes up when you go to the altar of God, just as I am without a little plea, and receive Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. It's your decision. Amen. Amen.